called home this morning, and I talked to my son, Leo, who is almost four, and he said, Mom, are you excited for your day? What are you doing? And I said, I'm a little nervous. I'm giving a talk that I really care about. And he knows me as, you know, out of control mummy or crazy mummy, but not, not nervous mum. So this made him a little bit concerned, and he said, why? And I said, because this is a group of incredibly important people, and I'm talking about something I care about fiercely. And that makes mom a little nervous. So there was this long pause, and I could tell his little brain was working. And then he said in his little voice, well, will they have weapons? <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> and my first reaction was, gosh, that is such a good point. I don't think they'll have weapons. <laughs> I'm so relieved. And then my second thought was, Richard, I thought about um, your rule yesterday where you said um, you can only understand something relative to what you understand your context. And I'm a Quaker. And so to think that my four-year-old's biggest question was if you all had weapons does concern me. And I'm going to follow up with him on that, as you can imagine. <laughs> and I hope none of you have weapons. Um, so I'm going to speak with you about end of life. And although it's one of my favorite topics, it made me a little sad at first because TED Med is such an extraordinarily sexy event. And the only people in the world who can make end of life sexy are Seiko and Steve. Um, so what I wanted to um, really talk about today was something like vitality, being engaged and being empowered and living the life that you want. And then it hit me. That's what end of life actually is. And that's what it can be when it's done well, it's just not usually. 70% of people want to die at home, and only 30% do. And here's another stat that you might not have thought about recently. You only die once. Think about that for a second. You only die once. Those aren't my words. Those are Atul Gawande's in his incredible essay, Letting Go, which I'm now declaring as mandatory reading for everybody at TED Med. Um, end of life in the US has somehow failed to become personal. It's like this thing that we put on a shelf and ignore. And getting what you want at end of life has become synonymous with filling out waivers and getting affidavits and going to some lawyer's office where you pay a lot of money and you get excited when you get to keep the pen. But that's, that's not what it's all about, not at all. And I want to tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was this extraordinary woman named Za, short for Rosaria. She was first-generation Italian, breathtaking to look at, driven to become a pharmacist, the first in her family to go to college. She was madly in love with her husband, John, and her daughter, Alessia, who was the apple of her eye. She was human, of course, as we all are. She loved to enjoy. She spent money she didn't always have. She was generous to her fault. And deep within Za welled this enormous sense of joy she was so grateful, so full of gratitude for the life that she had. And as it turned out, deep within Za also, also lived cancer. And not just any cancer, but the, the terrible and unforgiving brain cancer, glioblastoma, which was described by one of her surgeons as whipped cream in a sponge, virtually impossible to eradicate. The seven-month battle that Za waged against her cancer was an a mighty one. She endured two massive brain surgeries. She had chemotherapy. She had radiation. She had all the related humiliations. And the cancer really didn't care. Can you imagine being 32, being in love, loving your new job, loving being a mom, carrying with you all these joys, and, and, and really being excited about the opportunity to stand up for your brother as he got married on New Year's Eve. But instead of putting on your sexiest dress and your highest heels, being ambulanced from one hospital to another because they had found a mass in your head, can you imagine waking up that next morning in the hospital, surrounded by much of the same family that had flown in, some all the way from Sicily for this wedding, only to hear from them that the mass was actually a brain tumor? Can you imagine? sitting on this cot covered with a crinkly piece of paper after six exhausting weeks of radiation, worrying that your daughter, hoping your daughter wasn't wreaking too much havoc 
in the waiting room where she waited with your mom, you're freezing in your Johnny, and hearing from the doctors that the radiation hadn't worked and that the cancer had actually grown. Can you imagine knowing that you were dying at 32? I don't know for sure that she did know, even though we were there with her almost every single night over those seven months. And I don't know because we never talked about it. Death just wasn't something you talked about in our family. It was a topic that, that we just didn't engage on. And all those doctors who cared for her in this hospital that was ranked number one for this type of cancer, they didn't ask her about it either. They did ask us what we wanted when the end was near, however. We didn't know because we hadn't discussed it. But our gut was that she would want to go home. And so that's what we told them. We want to take her home. The head oncologist um, looked down at us and said, you can't. Her case is way too complicated. She's going to have to stay here in the hospital. So I work in the healthcare space, and I am hardly what you would call a shy and retiring wallflower. But when that head oncologist looked down at us and said, you can't, I absolutely froze. I caved. And my man, Antonio, her brother, who had spent most of that past seven months really embarrassed by how much I pushed back on all of her care team, he stood up and he said, no, we are absolutely taking her home. And so we did. And that very first night that we had her home, after two months of being in the hospital and her daughter, Alessia, really being afraid to, to, to cuddle up next to her, to hold her, this mom that she really wasn't able to recognize, after the very first night, she was safely surrounded by those sacred four walls and the smells and the comforts and familiarities of your home, Alessia crawled up in bed next to her. And for the first time in eight weeks, she gave her mom, she gave her, mom her medicine. And for the first time since Zah's second surgery, Alessia tucked her head into the crook of her mummy's neck. And Zah, who hadn't spoken or opened her eyes in at least a week, woke up fully and looked her daughter straight in the eyes and loved her in the way that only a mummy can. And the next night she died, peacefully, at home. I wonder sometimes who got the greatest gift that night. Was it Zah? finally at home at peace, able to connect with her daughter? Was it Alessia, who's now almost nine, and who to this day crawls up into my lap and asks me to tell the story about how she was the last thing her mom looked at and how her mom's face had softened an unbelievable peace on this last night? Or is it really the rest of us who almost missed this most extraordinary moment? End of life, reinventing it, is a gift for everybody. And it's something that we have to do unquestionably, 100%, we have to do this better. And so we came up with this idea. What if we could figure out a way to get this conversation started? What if we could figure out a way to engage in this topic with grace? Just five very simple questions that we could all commit to being able to answer for ourselves and for our loved ones. And the thought was this. If we could answer these questions for ourselves, if we could answer them for our loved ones, then we could focus our energy on making sure that the intent that they represented was honored. Could you answer these five questions? Do you know the answer to these five questions for your loved ones? If you were in the state, would you want to be at home or would you want to be in the hospital? There really is no wrong answer. It's only wrong if no one knows your answer and no one is willing to advocate for you. And we've seen that once this conversation gets started, when people start to share these thoughts with each other, then the lawyers and the affidavits and the system then intervenes to bowl over our intent. It stops being intimidating. We become empowered. You only die once. Die the way you want. And make sure your loved ones have that same honor. But if we wanted, we could do more than that. Make no mistake about it. The power in this room right now could single-handedly change the way we as a nation deal with end of life. We could get this conversation started in a national way, in a game-changing game way. You are an amazing group of people, and you all do a lot of talking, and you do a lot of influencing. What if you just added this one slide to your talks? What if you became ambassadors for, for making this a national, a national thing that we all discuss together? the currency and the value that we all have as our social networks. If we all committed to sharing this with our own circle of influence,
By January, we could cover the entire US. Take this on as a mission. It's just one slide. It's just five questions. It's two minutes to spread the word. Think of the enormous difference that we could make. Help us engage with grace. Thank you.